Welcome to Co-op Connections, an online workshop sponsored by CDS Consulting Co-op. Thanks for joining us. October is Co-op Month, and 2012 is the United Nations International Year of the Cooperative. So in honor of those events, we gathered our fantastic panelists from last year's Co-op Connections workshop to talk some more about all the exciting things going on in the world of co-ops. As I said, we're pleased once again that this amazing collection of worldwide leaders in the co-op movement were able to be with us, and I'd like to thank all of our panelists for joining us today. I'm certainly looking forward to hearing their insights, and I'm sure you are too. So as soon as I've completed our introductions, we'll begin our roundtable discussion with our experts. Over the next hour, we hope to increase understanding of the larger world of cooperatives and why they matter, explore issues of interest to cooperative leaders, build enthusiasm for cooperatives, celebrate Co-op Month, and prepare for the 2012 United Nations International Year of the Cooperative. Now our panelists here today are Paul Hazen, President and CEO of the National Cooperative Business Association, Chuck Gould, Director General, International Cooperative Alliance, Robin Schrader, CEO, the National Cooperative Grocers Association, Stuart Reed, Executive Director of the Food Co-op Initiative, Marilyn Scholl, Manager of CDS Consulting Co-op, and Kevin Edberg, Executive Director of Cooperative Development Services. I'm, my name is Joel Kapischke. I'm a C-Build Consultant with the CDS Consulting Co-op, and I'll be the moderator today. The first question for our panel is many believe that cooperatives are a better business model. How did you personally get involved in cooperatives and why are cooperatives important to you? Um, I got uh, my start with cooperatives when I was 12 years old. Uh, my grandfather and I had a very large garden. We got very overzealous in the planting of rutabagas one year. Uh, that fall, Grandpa sold them to the local co-op, but he sold them in my name, and I got a check for them, like 78 bucks or something. And about six months later, I got another check for 78 cents, like 1% of sales. And I didn't understand what that was at the time. I now realize that I was a patron member of a cooperative, and that was my first initiation. Today, I'm a member of a couple of different co-ops, and... Uh, uh, and pleased to make my living helping people start cooperatives or, or expand them. Well, I have been uh, around cooperatives uh, most of my life, as, as many people have been, without always uh, being fully aware of it. Uh, I looked around at one point and, and realized, without having always been conscious of it, that uh, the mortgage I had uh, on, a, on a piece of property was through the credit union. Uh, I was buying food groceries at the food co-op, I was getting uh, uh, electricity for a home I had in Minnesota uh, from a rural electric cooperative. So I had been involved for some time, but it was really only a year ago that I came to uh, cooperatives full-time uh, as uh, Director General of the International Cooperative Alliance uh, here in, uh, in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, which is the, the, the umbrella organization for cooperatives around the world. We have members in 90-plus in countries uh, around the world, and, and we represent cooperatives uh, in intergovernmental organizations like the UN and in global media uh, issues. And why they're important to me, uh, you really just have to look around. Uh, if you look at the challenges that, that, uh, that most of the developed world is having today, the skepticism that people have about the, the, uh, the, the capital business model, the, the problems we see with the financial system, and you remember back in, uh, in the late 80s, the problems, the challenges that central government uh, economic systems placed, uh, faced. Today, there's never been a greater need for cooperatives. We have an incredible story to tell. We're an incredible alternative. We're a serious business model as an alternative to, to these that are failing people around the, around the world. And uh, it's essential that we tell that story. Well, I grew up on a farm, so I had cooperatives in my background as a farm kid, uh, but I uh, got my first job working in a co-op in 1978 at the Gordon Park Food Co-op in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and it was a traditional grocery co-op. We sold cigarettes and Twinkies and soda and beer, and, um, as well as apples and oranges and to tofu. Um, that co-op wouldn't have existed 
had the co-op not been there. That store wouldn't have existed if the co-op had not been there. The uh, brothers that had owned it previously wanted to sell it and couldn't find anyone to buy it. Their, the neighborhood wasn't very wealthy, there was no parking, and without the neighbors coming together, there just wouldn't have been a store. So that first lesson really taught me that people coming together can uh, do what needs to be done. They can provide themselves with services that private capital sometimes can't. Um, that people, uh, cooperatives make people and communities stronger. And those are lessons that have stayed with me to, these, to this day. Well, I, I grew up in a small town uh, in Wisconsin and uh, where there's a co-op on every corner of Main Street. Uh, but I didn't really realize the significance of cooperatives at that point until I um, graduated uh, 1978 from the University of Wisconsin with a degree in economics and business and went to work for a member of Congress from my home area. His name is, is Al Baldus. And uh, went to a lot of cooperative meetings with the congressman and uh, understood that uh, these were successful businesses, whether they were farmer co-ops, electric co-ops, or credit unions, but that they also had a social purpose. And uh, that really intrigued me and uh, said, okay, here's economic success with improving the community. And uh, following his defeat in 1980 for re-election, I found myself unemployed and ended up working for a housing co-op developer uh, that was based in Madison, Wisconsin. So for me, it's uh, an opportunity to take my interest in business and economics and apply it to uh, building community, building wealth, uh, social purposes that improve people's lives and the lives of, uh, of those in our communities. Well, I got involved um, almost by accident, as I think many people do. I was in college and looking for a source of natural foods. We, my, my girlfriend at the time was vegetarian, but hadn't really developed a, any knowledge about the diet that she was uh, eating. So we started going to the Northeast Co-op, a very small store in Minneapolis that was there at that time, and uh, started volunteering, which was typical of the co-ops in that time, and got involved with the people, started finding out about the co-op community, and really fell in love with that as much as the food and, and the, the uh, lower prices that we could get. But uh, I started learning about the co-op model right from that point on and, and became involved with other co-ops, always finding that the community was what kept bringing me back, that that was really the key to the whole advantage of the co-ops for me was understanding that I was part of this bigger community that cared about the world we were in in more than just getting the cheapest price for my food. So that message was important, and as a workplace, the community also was critical to me as a place that I kept coming back to and, and looking for that uh, pl place where I could be a part of, a, of something bigger than just earning a wage and really feel good about it. I personally got involved uh, when I was involved in coffee and uh, started working for Frontier Natural Products Co-op. Uh, sourcing organic farm, farmer cooperative coffee from South America. And what really attracted me overall to the model was the mission aspect of doing business. I had come right out of college and worked in um, very much for-profit business and I just found it to be extremely refreshing to have my personal values reflected in the work that I was doing every day. Great. Thank you, everyone. Let's move on to our next question. Co-ops have been relatively resilient, operating in highly competitive markets and a challenging economy. Why is that, and how can we build on that success? What are the most important aspects of the cooperative advantage for members and potential members to understand? Uh, this past week, I've been attending meetings in Washington of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. And, of course, the main topic is the ongoing uh, economic challenges and the banking crisis uh, in, in Europe. And uh, I learned and have known for a while that uh, about half of the uh, banks in Europe are cooperative banks, uh, very much like our, uh, our, our, our credit unions here in the United States, the retail financial cooperatives. And uh, they have survived the, uh, uh, the financial crisis and the banking crisis very well. Major reason is that they don't have outside stockholders. So the value of the cooperative is 
cooperative bank is not increasing or decreasing depending upon what the current situation is uh, on the stock markets. So they've been able to conduct their business uh, very well uh, and continue to serve their members and are seen as a really solid, safe haven, haven uh, for for people uh, who are we're looking for a safe place for their money. So the same thing is true here in the United States where the fact that we don't have outside stockholders, that we operate on a cooperative or a mutual basis uh, and, and are not impacted with the ups and downs of the stock market, uh, really have provided a great benefit to uh, consumers and members of cooperatives uh, here in the U.S. So I think that's an important lesson to be learned is that because because the uh, the cooperatives don't need to take risks in order to maximize profit, they're a much safer bet during a recession. I think really the reason that food co-ops in particular have weathered the economy as, as well as we have is the connection that consumers feel to their local food store. And food is a very important part of everyday life. Hopefully most people are eating every day and having that connection to where your food comes from, from an entity that is committed to the local community and the local economy, local growers, um, and all of the values that um, are represented by the cooperative model, I think people resonate with having that connection to their day-to-day -day source for food. And I think the thing that we have to continue to build on is that connection to the mission-based aspects of doing business. It isn't just about transactions. It isn't just about buying food. It's about those social commitments, those environmental commitments that are represented by food co-ops. I think that's because people trust co-ops. And in this economic climate, um, people are really questioning whether or not we can trust big corporations. And there's a lot of questions about whether or not we trust government. And surveys have shown that people do trust co-ops. Uh, co-ops exist to meet people's needs. They don't exist for other purposes. So it makes sense that people trust co-ops. What we need to keep doing or, or strengthen, I think, is recommit ourselves to being trustworthy, to earning and, and keep earning people's trust. Uh, we can do that by always being sure that we're making decisions in the best interest of the members. Uh, we tell the truth. Trust the process. Democracy is messy sometimes. Uh, having uh, lots of people in on uh, thinking about and, and making decisions um, maybe not be as smooth. But in the end, if we really trust people and their participation in the co-op, um, it can lead to good decisions for people as a whole and reinforce that co-ops are trustworthy and have the best interest of the co-op at heart. So in addition, the purpose of a co-op is to serve the needs of the members as a whole. And there's, there's a lot of diversity often within the member, membership, different people who want different things. So it's really important for co-ops to hear the me, to hear the individual voices about what I want or um, what individuals want, but then to serve the we and to explain to members why decisions are made in the best interest of the we. So not everybody gets their way in a co-op, um, but if the co-op leaders are attentive to uh, what is in the best interest of the co-op as a whole and communicate that clearly, transparently to members, it can be really helpful. Well, I think we see that co-op members are, are very aware of the politics of food and the things that drive business. While a lot of people shop at co-ops because they like the food in the community, what the advantage is really in the different economic model that we are pursuing. The, the ability to control our own destinies to a certain extent and to have a voice in, in how food politics plays out in our lives. Supporting our local producers, keeping jobs in the community. I mean, these are all very big topics in the news and among many people of many persuasions, but co-ops are, are doing something about it on the ground level and actually making these opportunities real for people. So for that reason, they will always be relevant. Why they're resilient? Well, again, I think it's the same reasons that they're relevant. And we do struggle in, in down economies 
somewhat, but I think co-ops have done much better than other businesses because people are willing to invest their trust and even the, the dollars in a business that they believe in as opposed to a business that obviously hasn't done much to take care of them and it's just because they're struggling. Uh, you know, we, we've got tight money. We're going to spend it more wisely. So in some ways, economy, poor economies help co-ops. And traditionally, I think we've seen a rise in the number of co-ops during poor economies. Unfortunately, there is, when co-ops have risen and become very strong, there's also been a, a pushback from our the competitive marketplace. And if, if they feel that we are infringing on their sacred ground, there have been some pretty severe efforts to suppress the formation of co-ops in the past. And are we past that in our in our political life? I hope so. But uh, there is a risk, I think, that when we are successful, we also are a threat to the status quo. Uh, so we need this, all the strength we can get to and the support of, of as many different people as possible in this movement. And we'll keep going. We've always bounced back. The uh, International Labor Organization, the ILO, uh, published a report just at the start of this recession or shortly after the start of the recession called the resilience of the cooperative uh, in times of recession and they focused on the the fact that cooperatives were faring relatively well in this difficult financial time and there were a couple reasons for that one is because the risk model is different cooperatives are not structured to take imprudent risks. They're not trying to maximize the, the, the profit on an investment. They're trying to solve a problem. They're, they're serve, they serve as a solution for their members. And so they, they operate in an area they know. They serve members' interests. They don't go out and try to, uh, to, uh, to get into uh, all kinds of esoteric uh, investment vehicles that cause so much trouble in this, uh, in this most recent uh, uh, decline. The other reason that cooperatives have, have fared better, have fared well, is because their members trust them. And members in a time of crisis look to, to safe harbors. They look to places that are credible, where there's integrity, where they have confidence. And members have a lot of confidence uh, in their cooperatives. We can build on that success by emphasizing how we're different, to emphasize trust, to emphasize transparency and to really emphasize that cooperatives are a place where members have a voice and we're at a time in the world when many people are wondering if they really can have an impact. They're wondering if the financial systems that govern their lives, that dictate their lives, that control how they can work and how they, where they shop and how they shop and what goods are available, whether those are really failing them. And we can emphasize that in a cooperative, the members have a voice. They govern. The people who benefit from the cooperative, in fact, uh, dictate how it, uh, how it operates. The uh, International Year of Cooperatives in 2012, which the UN has declared, is an incredible opportunity for us to get this message out and to really tell the difference uh, between the cooperative and other, other financial models. And, in fact, the, uh, the ICA board, uh, the International Cooperative Alliance board, uh, has set a vision that by the end of this decade, by 2020, the cooperative will be the fastest growing business model in the world. And we think that that's very, very doable. So the resilience comes from the governance process. Um, the be, Because the business needs to deliver a service or de, uh, fill a need that uh, is experienced by the owner members of the co-op, the focus is on how do we deliver the service uh, in the way that people need to have it delivered and then do that at least reasonable cost or at least sustainable cost. Um, and so the resiliency comes. We're not going out trying to take risk to make return on, on invested capital. Our, our objective is to make sure that the needs get met. And that enforces an internal discipline that, that creates this resilience. We don't get overextended. Um, I guess sometimes we get uh, we probably take fewer risks than we should, but the the resilience comes from there. Um, I think the opportunities for growth come from an understanding of that model, and because cooperatives, while a large uh, are a part of our economy, 
They're not always a part of everyone's everyday existence, and we don't always recognize the difference that comes when you're operating a business to meet a member need as opposed to finding a new customer um, and extracting uh, not only the value of the service but a, prom a profit from that customer. And there's a whole different mindset that comes, and, and once we recognize that, then we can play with that in a positive way. Great. Thanks, everybody. Our next question. There is a growing wave of interest in developing new cooperatives in the U.S., especially with food co-ops. How can the existing cooperative community best support these efforts? There's many ways that we can use their support, and, and many of the food co-op community are doing a fantastic job already of supporting the startups. We Almost every store that's getting off the ground is turning to one of the existing stores, or in some cases several of the existing stores, for technical advice, for just plain uh, peer support, for mentoring. Some of the co-ops have been able to help with small loans or grants to help in development funding. And with almost as many new co-ops starting as there are existing, that's a challenge for that community to be able to support so many. But again, they've stepped up to the plate and done a great job. I think that by having a more consistent vision of how we will support co-ops in the future, we can do an even better job. And for the co-op, established co-op community to work, to have a, a plan for how they will support co-op development and whether that includes funding, which we would hope that it would because it's always difficult to find capital in a, in a grassroots organizing effort, but uh, whether it includes the funding part it will include ways of providing those support that they need so desperately and uh, access to the talent and the ideas and the connections that the existing co-ops have. Uh, in some cases, co-ops have become very, more than mentors. They've become almost uh, almost partners in development with their, their local food co-op organizing teams, and, and that's been great. Well, the existing co-op community has already been very supportive in these efforts. Uh, we did a survey recently of people who are involved in startups, and the number one place that they go for support and resources is to existing food co-ops. So first, keep doing what we're doing, sharing our stories and our resources, reaching out and helping when we can, um, referring people to the food co-op initiative so that they know where to go to get the first uh, level of support and basic resources for starting a co-op is really helpful. I think another thing it's really important to remember is that starting a co-op in 2011 is not the same as it was starting a co-op in the 1970s or the 1980s. The competitive market is a lot different. The economic market is a lot different. People's expectations have changed. The demographics in terms of the amount of time people spend uh, working is quite different than it was in the 1970s. So the ways that our existing food co-ops got started, many of them in the, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, some of those same things won't work for this current wave of co-ops. So while, while it's good to tell our stories, it's also important to recognize that things are different. And we also don't want the co-ops starting today to make the same mistakes that the co-ops that started in the last generation made. Um, probably more than half of those co-ops went out of business, and we hope that we would um, not repeat those failures by starting out with really good practices. I think there's three or four things that come to mind. One is is encouragement, simply um, uh, answering questions, engaging with folks in your community or when they make contact, but to be of encouragement uh, and a referral to help them get connected to the places uh, that can provide assistance so that they don't get continuously lost or, or stuck in a runaround, uh, that we actually get into the places that can help them advance their interests. I think the second thing is actual mentorship and engagement, uh, whether that's um, uh, helping with management of a startup or um, allowing staff members to interact and support uh, new uh, new startups, uh, uh, but a whole variety of uh, ways of allowing new co-ops and, and boards and, and management to hang out and learn from the lessons that we've uh, that we've um, already learned. Uh, among our established co-ops. I think a third one is actually um, investment in the, the support network that supports these young, growing, and, and, and uh, startup uh, 
co-ops, things like food co-op initiative, um, uh, co-op development centers, engagement, financial support, um, resource and energy to support the centers because um, every any given startup, the group that's doing that is only ever going to start one co-op in their life. We need to have a strong infrastructure of folks who, are, who will work with a number of startups and we need that network to be strong. Supporting that financially and with other resources is, uh, is really important. And then I think the fourth way is that we actually engage in advocacy, that we tell our story about cooperatives to policymakers, uh, whether that's at state or local levels, um, uh, that we uh, certainly tell it at federal levels, that we say cooperatives have a place in this economy and we um, have a rightful place at that economic development table uh, and folks, you need to, uh, policymakers, um, uh, folks in government, you need to pay attention to this. And having that come from an established business that carries a different weight than coming from uh, folks who are not yet in business. And so active engagement there is really important. Well, one of the things that we're doing here at NCGA is really examining, examining the role that we can play in the development of these um, startups or, or interested groups in wanting food co-ops. And there are other enter entities in our sector between the Food Co-op Initiative and CDS Consulting Co-op and others. Not everyone can do every aspect of development in these, in these projects. And so we're really trying to focus and align uh, a model where we can all work together at different phases of development of these projects um, so that these projects have a best chance of success. We all have places in the development curve that we are most suited to plug into. And so that's one of the things that, that NCGA and our subsidiary development cooperative is, are working on right now. I guess if I were to offer something for an individual local co-op to do, it would be to mentor a neighboring group. I mean, if there's someone nearby, be a mentor. Be willing to have conversations. Be willing to talk about you know, different strategies from your own local experience. And, and many startup groups are craving that kind of connection to other cooperators. Well, if you take a look historically, whenever there's an economic downturn, uh, people turn to their neighbors and say, you know, there has to be a different way uh, for us to organize uh, our business affairs. And uh, so we saw that and you know, following the Great uh, Depression, every t and we've seen that since every time there's been ups and downs on the marketplace. So the reaction that we're, we're seeing where people are saying, gee, uh, let's take a look at how we could to organize ourselves for our mutual benefit, the cooperative model certainly fits that, is something that from a historical perspective we know actually works. So I think one thing that we can do, the existing cooperative community can help uh, people who are organizing new cooperatives with the lessons learned over the many, many decades of what works and what doesn't work when you're developing a cooperative. So that's, that's let's let make the same mistakes that perhaps we've made in the past. And so that's, that's uh, uh, one area where that the existing co-op community can be uh, helpful. The other, I think another area is um, working across different types of cooperative sectors so that other types of cooperatives could be supporting the interest in food co-op development, whether it's in best practices around governance uh, or uh, capital creation, uh, things like that. Uh, that's an area where NCBA has created a, is working on creating a cooperative investment fund uh, that would allow individuals and organizations to invest in the fund that would be a new source of capital uh, for cooperatives that want to expand and new cooperatives that gets that want to get started. So uh, this is another area where the existing co-op community could provide opportunities and, and for capital creation to help new startups. One of the seven principles and values of the International Cooperative Alliance is cooperatives help other cooperatives. And these are seven principles that go back to the days of the Rochdale pioneers in the 1840s. And these are principles and values that cooperatives in, in 90 plus countries around the world have adopted and, and agree are what define a cooperative. That intercooperation is essential. And we're at a time where we're seeing more of that. 
we're seeing the BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, now South Africa, the cooperatives in those countries are beginning to meet now as a group and looking at how they can engage in transactions with one another so that they can help support their economies, not only locally, but also by helping the cooperatives in those other countries support theirs. Uh, ICA hosts an expo, a trade fair, every two years. And the next one will be coming up at the end of the international year, at the end of 2012 in Manchester, UK, in, uh, in November. And this is an opportunity for cooperatives to bring their products and to bring their services together to a trade fair and to meet other cooperatives and to, and to build the relationships for ongoing transactions that really help in this, in this kind of development. At the same time, we're seeing newer cooperatives in new space, in new, in new areas, uh, want to begin to network with one another to learn from one another. So we have long had sectoral organizations. We have, a, we have a sector for banking cooperatives and credit unions. We have one for insurance. We have one for agriculture, for fisheries, for health care, for housing, for consumer cooperatives. And the cooperatives who work in energy are beginning to talk now and say, we need to understand better what's happening in other countries. There is this whole interest in, in new technology and how cooperatives can be part of that. We have worker cooperatives now. We have a sector for them. But to really uh, focus on some of these new areas is something else that we believe will help cooperatives grow in areas where we have some incredible opportunities. Thank you again. Our next question, the International Year of the Cooperative is being celebrated worldwide. What's one idea that local co-ops can do to join in the celebration? Well, when, when ICA's global board looked at the International Year, when we, we fought to get this with the United Nations and, uh, and we advocated for it and, and uh, they agreed that this, this was, uh, uh, was cooperatives are an idea whose time has come ag again and uh, that we should be recognized for the contributions we make. When the, the global board then said, well, we have this now, what, what do we do with this? How do we make sure that we don't squander this opportunity? There were all kinds of brainstorming ideas, as you can imagine about what we might do for a political agenda, for education, for academic uh, institutions, to get cooperatives in, in law firms and business schools. And all of that makes sense. And all of that is important. But we felt we should do one thing, just focus on one thing and do it really well. And the one thing that we felt was unique about this year that we couldn't do as effectively in other years is to really leverage the UN name to get public attention, public awareness to cooperatives. And if we can use this year not just as a celebration, and when December 31st comes in 2012, not just to say that was fun, we, we had events, it was really interesting, but to really begin to build a public relations campaign that we can build on year after year for the rest of the decade, and to get it off to a good solid start by leveraging the UN attention, we said that's really what we can do. So our, our hope and our goal is for cooperatives around the world to engage in the use of the logo and the slogan for the international year and to drive traffic to the 2012.coop website where people who are exposed to cooperatives during the year in different countries can learn more, more than we can tell them in a short time when they happen to be passing by the cooperative or seeing a, an annual report or seeing a shopping bag, but to drive them to the website to learn more and to get them hooked on what it means to be a values-based business. We have three key themes, three key messages in this global media campaign that we're launching for the international year. And the first one is that cooperatives are a serious business, that people understand, I think, many times that we're doing a lot of good locally. But they don't understand that there are huge cooperatives that are going head to head with large multinational corporations and succeeding. We're a serious alternative business model. The second message is that we're values based. We're not like multinational corporations. We do believe in sustainability. It's core to what we do. We believe in fair access. This is all part of what it means to be a cooperative. And the third is the message I mentioned before about you have a voice. You, you can make a difference. You can have a say in a cooperative. 
that's all part of the public relations campaign. If every cooperative engages in that around the world, we will surprise the public by the number of times they're exposed to it, by the number of sectors in which cooperatives are engaged. They'll see organizations they never understood were cooperatives, and they'll be impressed and intrigued and will want to learn more, and that's how we'll begin to get to that goal that by the end of this decade, cooperatives will be the fastest growing business model in the world. I think one of the great things, and particularly in the food co-op community, um, food co-ops um, have experienced tremendous growth and success in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, in part, I believe it's because they have paid attention to, the, to understanding the business model and they paid attention to governance, that linkage between um, the needs of the members reflected in a board of director, directors and their subsequent direction to management. Um, those things are present in the food co-op community. I would encourage members of the food co-op community to engage with other consumer-owned uh, co-ops, particularly all co-ops in general, but particularly other consumer-owned co-ops to say, what are the needs of our members in our community that are not yet met? And is there a legitimate place for us to be pursuing cooperative development in our own communities to meet the needs of our own members uh, and meet the needs of our communities? Um, simply starting the dialogue with their other with other co-ops in their communities and with their members and being open to seeing where this business model might have an additional impact, I think would be a great way to celebrate part of the uh, International Year of the Cooperative. Um, in addition to that, uh, any of the things that we can do to celebrate our past, to, to remember the day the lights came on in the farm, which is the rural electric story, or um, any of the ways that we remember how, co how uh, uh, credit unions have provided uh, alternatives to um, investor-owned banks and the benefits that come to our communities because of that. Anything that we can do to recall our stories, live them, and plant the seeds for the dreaming and scheming and gristful conversation that's necessary for us to move forward in, in this economy and, and into, the next, uh, uh, into the next millennium. Well, uh, NCGA has actually put a great deal of work into the International Year of the Cooperatives, and we have filmed a series of videos at some of our members in different regions all around the country at various different events hosted by Top Chef finalist Kevin Gillespie. And these videos are going to launch on January 24th over a virtual premiere party. I'd like to I'll give you a plug for Stronger Together strongertogether.coop for more information about that video launch. But if locally co-ops can do viewing parties or perhaps have those videos you know, playing in the store or some other means to draw consumer attention to those, they tell a great story of a lot of our members doing a lot of really cool things in all areas of the country. So there's one. Um, you can also you know, encourage folks in your local co-op to log on to strongertogether.coop often because we'll have a variety of different activities and information about cooperatives throughout the course of the year. Well, the International Year of Cooperatives declared by the United Nations is, is the greatest opportunity that we've had in decades to raise the profile of, of cooperatives. And as there's a growing interest in uh, the development of new cooperatives, especially food cooperatives, this is, all, this is a kind of a, uh, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Uh, people are out there receptive uh, to the idea of, of cooperatives, and we have this great platform uh, to build upon. Uh, so I think uh, – one thing that certainly cooperatives could do is to promote uh, uh, the, the International Year uh, uh, to um, uh, people in their communities using their existing uh, channels of communication. But I think the one thing that uh, existing cooperatives could do is to reach out across sectors. Uh, to say in our community we, there are more than just food cooperatives. There may be credit unions, worker cooperatives, housing co-ops, and really use this as an opportunity uh, to, to present a common message uh, around the international year. The theme is uh, cooperative enterprises build a better world, and so that's a message that I think will resonate in communities across, uh, across the country. Something specific that I think 
that uh, would be very valuable is to focus on young people that our cooperative message, again, I will resonate with young people, but be very deliberate and specific about creating activities that will appeal uh, to younger people, uh, you know, uh, events that maybe involve, uh, uh, you know, music, uh, uh, seminars that talk about uh, organizing uh, new types of businesses, you know, around the cooperative model, but being very deliberate upon involving young people and reaching out to young people around issues that they may find of, of value. So I think working across sectors, focusing on uh, events and activities and, and issues that will appeal to young people will, would be a great way to celebrate the International Year of Cooperatives. I think the best thing they can do is take advantage of their local connections. Because we are um, all independent businesses and we're spread out across the country, we've got this fantastic infrastructure in place to get the word out. Uh, it, we're not centralized and, and trying to push it out. We, we can just share it within our communities. And if every, every co-op were to craft their own local message around what they're doing and around the people in their community and get it out in the press or in some public event, the impact would be tremendous. People would hear about co-ops that wouldn't have otherwise and, and become interested and hopefully uh, check it out. Come and see the store, join a new co-op, think about what their, their choices mean. And so at the grassroots level, I would really like to see each store taking it on as a project locally, and, and, and not everybody having exactly the same answer to that question, but what works in our community? How can we make people excited about co-ops and get it in the press, get out on the streets, whatever it takes? Well, I think the first thing is to pass the resolution. Uh, and NCBA has, a, has a drafted a resolution for uh, co-ops to be able to use for their annual meetings or their board meetings to pass the resolution in support of the, the International Year of the Cooperative. I think another thing is to meet with other co-ops in your communities and explore what issues you have in common. Uh, credit unions, electric co-ops, worker co-ops, um, health care co-ops, any kind of other co-ops that might exist in your community and use uh, your collaboration with them both to share ideas but also to create greater visibility for cooperatives in your community. I think there are other opportunities for uh, celebrating, uh, creating awards. Um, maybe there's a, a co-op hero award that each community could um, start this year. Name it after a, a, a co-op hero in your community and, and honor someone each year with a, a, someone who exemplifies the cooperative principles. Um, I think another really important thing is getting staff excited and so um, it's something more that um, managers of co-ops would be involved with but finding ways to, uh, to uh, help staff understand the importance of this year that we're having, what a great opportunity it is to really share the vision and the promise of cooperatives with people around the world. Fantastic ideas, everyone. One last question. Let's go back to that personal connection. The theme of the International Year of the Cooperative is cooperative enterprises build a better world. What's one thing that you are looking forward to seeing in this better world that's coming? I'm personally looking forward to a real cultural shift in our, in our country uh, and around the world about environmental practices. And I'm also hoping that cooperatives can become a part of this conversation about the disparity of, of wealth and, and distribution of wealth. And I think here in this country, especially in the political climate that we're looking at right now, class warfare is becoming a part of the conversation in a, in a not so constructive manner if cooperatives can, can get into that conversation and turn it into a more constructive place. I think that that would be enormous, an enormous shift that our children, my grandchildren, and their grandchildren are going to benefit from. So personally, I'd like to see that happen. <laughs> um. One thing, well, or, I think or two or three. I, yeah, yeah. I have been reading some uh, historical fiction about the late 1800s and the labor movements and the anarchists and their efforts to 
change the robber baron economy to something that the work that's provided more support to the workers. So I'm I'm a bit radicalized at the moment, but I'll uh, I'll take a stab at that. Uh, I really do believe, though, that co-ops have the ability to help um, provide better, more meaningful work to people and opportunities for people that are often neglected by uh, the more traditional investor economy. Um, invest, investment in, in corporations that don't respond to the local needs, a lot of people are questioning whether that is still a valid model and, or, and how we can find an economy and a lifestyle that is more meaningful to people and where corporations aren't the people that elect the government, but you know people have, have regained their voice. And, and in organizing co-ops, one of the things that we see all the time is that we're not just organizing a co-op. We're, or, we're, we're organizing a cooperative store. We're also organizing a cooperative of people. And that is an organization, a grassroots organization, that builds social capital in the community and, and empowers people to, to do more things of the same nature, they, to go out there and really uh, they become a new part of their community, more involved, more active, and uh, leaders for other folks as well. So um, that, that's where I would like to see the co-op community continuing to make its impact. That's a, that's a great question. We actually are launching a project as part of the International Year called Stories.coop. And this is an opportunity for cooperatives to tell their story. They'll be able to, we'll be crowdsourcing stories, we'll be seeking some out. And we intend in this through this website, we'll pick one story a day, 366 stories next year because it's a leap year as it turns out. And we will feature a different cooperative every every day and through the course of those 366 stories, the public will see the regional diversity, they'll see the sectoral diversity, they'll see the, the diversity in terms of size and scale of cooperatives and they'll have a true sense of how it is that cooperatives are building a better world, how collectively that happens. It's very different in, uh, in, in different parts of the world. And in some cases, there are some very inspiring stories about worker cooperatives, people who would be starving if it weren't for this opportunity to come together and share the production resources in a worker cooperative. In other cases, it's the sustainability. It's the fact that, that we're keeping the environment from being destroyed by the way in which we approach the production of food or the production of goods and services. It's a different story, it's a complex story, and it's one that people will begin to get the full flavor of through the stories.coop site. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think that the economy, uh, as it is today, driven by uh, the profit motive and only by the profit motive, makes uh, our world um, often a very sad place that the people who have a lot of money uh, and are able to invest and use their capital and the capital gets rewarded, um, they just continue to get richer and the people who don't have resources continue to get poorer. And as long as our society is based on rewarding capital um, instead of rewarding participation, that gap between the rich and the poor, um, I, I can only imagine that it would continue to grow. I think that leads to a lot of problems in, in our society. Uh, a lot of frustration with um, uh, people who aren't able to, to provide a, enough for their families. And so I think a change in the, in the way business runs, uh, the way the economy functions so that it's more important, or at least equally important, what happens to people and what happens to the planet as it is to make profit. Especially in America, we have lost our way in understanding how we own the things that we hold in common, whether that be our local park or a national park. We've lost a conversation about how we act together as civil society through government as well as non-government to own the things that we hold in common and to effectively govern ourselves. There is much that the cooperative community, well-practiced, could teach or remind us in civil society about how to um, uh, deal with diverse visions, to um, use democratic process, to engage in thoughtful, healthy debate, that, and then ultimately leading to effective 
solutions to our, our shared problems. And the thing that I think the, the, the biggest contribution that I would love to see is a renewed understanding of, of democracy practiced economically as well as politically uh, in a very true and genuine way. And I think that's something that would be a great contribution if, uh, if that could be brought to pass. Well, I, the, the contributions that cooperatives have made to give people a power and voice around the world are well documented. And personally, I'd like to see in this country is a, a uh, outreach uh, that would be focused on recent immigrants to this country to help them assimilate uh, better into the economy in our society. And I'm thinking specifically of people who are immigrating here uh, from, you know, Latin American countries, that we use uh, the cooperative business model as a way to integrate people into the economy better uh, so that they can take advantage of uh, of of our society and our way of life. And so my my goal is that uh, we can use the international year uh, to reach out to recent immigrants uh, and and use it as a way to improve their lives because if that happens then our country and our society will be will benefit. Thank you all again for sharing your insights, wisdom and perspectives here today. Well, clearly, we could probably spend all day discussing co-ops and still have plenty more to share and learn about our co-op connections. But our time for today is up. Hopefully, we can get together again in 2012 for another roundtable on issues of interest to our co-ops. Once again, I'd like to extend a special thank you to our panelists. We are honored that you joined us. Paul Hazen, NCBA. Charles Gould, ICA. Robin Schrader, NCGA. Stuart Reed. Food Co-op Initiative, Marilyn Scholl, CDS Consulting Co-op, and Kevin Edberg, Cooperative Development Services. On behalf of CDS Consulting Co-op, I'd like to extend my thanks to everyone for being with us today, and we always welcome your feedback. This recording and our entire library of resources is available online as part of our C-Build library at cdsconsulting.coop, or just search online for C-Build Library. Thanks again for taking part in Co-op Connections. Have a great Co-op Month and fantastic Year of the Cooperative.